post this video on YouTube. Um, just when we're done, well, once it's done uh, compiling, I'll post this on YouTube and that way you'll have access to it in the future. James, I um, uh, just wanted to request if you have the option, can you turn the captioning on? Oh, captioning, yeah. Let's see, live transcript. Yes. Assign, nope, I will, ooh, copy, nope, enable, there it is. Enable. And yeah. those who don't want it, then just cross the button on top of the screen and they don't see it, but those who would like to use it would see it. All right, there we go. We'll see how it translates some of the statistics language. That'll be fun. Well, I speak with an accent, so it will be better with, than that. <laughs> it does right. a pretty good job, although I have to say. <laughs> oh, good. All right, looks like we have a few more uh, uh, jumping in. So we will once again post that. Uh, here's the link to the data. Um, so what, uh, what uh, Dr. Billings asked me to do is cover just the basics of uh, measurement models and structural models using SPSS and AMOS. And we only have an hour and a half, so it's not a lot of time. I, I do have to end sharply, uh, I have probably a minute before that, before, what is that, noon your time? Um, or no, 11 your time, uh, because I have another meeting that I have to jump over to. So we will see what we can do. It, even though we're sort of uh, constrained time-wise, if you have questions, please do ask them. Um, Anything we don't get to, I have videos for. Uh, some of you may know I, I run a YouTube channel that has a bunch of, of SEM videos on it. Um, uh, videos for pretty much anything you want to do in SPSS, AMOS, Smart PLS, M+. Uh, I think that's it. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to add some more, con well, continuously. And I have a, a course, actually, for anything, if, if, what, you, we, if what we do here is interesting to you and you want to learn more about uh, analysis in SPSS and AMOS, uh, here's an online course. I'm putting in the link here uh, in the chat window. There's an online course that goes over all this stuff in way more depth and actually explains it, gives you references, has exercises, projects, exams, uh, grades if you want uh, for your doctoral students. And um, so it, it covers about three, two to three semesters of SEM in that one course, which is about a 50 hour course. So if, if you find this useful, let's get started. So I'm going to just open that data set. Um, I better share my screen, huh? Let me share my screen. Let's see, how about not that? Let's go over to here, take that down. I'm gonna share my screen and you should just see a tree right now. Um, and I'm gonna open up that data set that uh, we've been sending in the chat window. If you still need that link, uh, we can post it one more time. But it's called eam2021workshop.sav. Also in this workshop, I'm not gonna cover sort of the, the, the preliminaries of uh, prepping your data, of going from a raw data set to, um, to a cleaned data set. This data set is already cleaned and um, I'm going to assume that uh, you've all had a, at least a basic statistics class. So you know what a p-value is, you know what a coefficient is um, and all of that. If you don't, then I'll, I'll at least, I'll speak, I'll, I'll interpret things so that it will become evident as we go. And here we go. Again, if you have questions, feel free to, um, feel free to chat them in the chat window or just stop and, um, and speak up. I just got to find where my chat window is so that I can keep track of it. Here we go. Let me pull this down here. Okay. I'm just getting all set up here. Hopefully you should be able to see my screen. And here we go. So we're going to start with a factor analysis, uh, an exploratory factor analysis. And there's some debate out there whether uh, you need to do an exploratory factor analysis. I should explain. Exploratory factor analysis is, is a class of factor analysis where you find common groupings among a set of variables. And it's unguided or undirected, meaning we leave it to the software, SPSS, to determine those groupings based on um, iterative correlations uh, between items and item groups. So we give 
we give SPSS a set of items and we say, find us the groupings here. And what it does is it goes through each item and in the covariance matrix, it finds how is this item related to that item? How's this set of items related to this set of items? And what it does is it tries to form tight groups of highly correlated items into what we call factors and then try to separate those groups into distinct factors so that there is as much tightness within a factor and distance between factors as possible. It's a lot like cluster analysis, but a 90 degree turn of a cluster analysis. A cluster analysis is trying to find groupings of, of cases of rows in your data set and factor analysis is trying to find groupings of columns or variables. So we're going to do that. And, and why would you even do this? Um, an unguided factor analysis because most of you, you'll be coming into your data set knowing already what the factors are supposed to be, right? You, you built a survey or you collected data where you had five measures that were intended to measure a specific construct. So why do we need to uh, explore whether they factor together? Uh, the answer is there's debate about that. Um, probably about half, maybe even more than half of the methodologists out there say you don't. You don't have to factor now, explore your factor analysis. You can just do a confirmatory factor analysis. Um, I am of the camp on the other side where I say, well, it doesn't hurt anything. It's not hard and it gives you more information. And as a scholar, more information about your data is usually better than less information. So I still always do an exploratory factor analysis just to inform myself. Is it required? No, um, unless you truly don't have a measurement theory going into your data set. Um, let's say you've inherited a data set, secondary data, uh, then definitely do an exploratory factor analysis. Um, but I do it all the time anyway, because it, it, it emerges uh, issues that you might not see in a confirmatory factor analysis. Okay, somebody says, we just heard the kind of opposite yesterday and dive directly into CFA. Like I said, there's debate on this topic and I'm in the smaller, I'm in the minority uh, of scholars on this. And again, my, my logic here is, what does it hurt? It's so easy and quick, just do it. Okay, let's do it. So here's the data set. Um, for those who are following along, uh, I'm gonna try to go at a moderate pace. I'm not gonna go as fast as I usually go. Um, and I will be going somewhat slow for those who are just watching. So I beg your forgiveness and, and your patience. So the first thing we'll do <clears throat> is we'll go to analyze at the top menu and you're gonna to go to dimension reduction because what we're trying is to do is reduce the number of dimensions used to explain our data. And then go to factor, whoops, dimension reduction, factor. And this will bring up a window like this where we have all of our variables on the left and yours might look different from this. Yours might look like this. Um, and we should probably fix that before we move forward actually because it's gonna be a mess. So um, hit cancel if you're, if you're following along. Um, hit cancel real quick. Let's go up to edit and options. And this will save a lot of, of headache if you do this. So edit options. And that'll bring up this window. And what you wanna do is here on the general tab, change display labels to display names. But there's more, so don't close it just yet. Uh, but this is the first thing, change display labels to display names. And then over in the output tab, change um, these two, the outline labeling should be names and then labels down here and same here, names and then labels down here in the pivot table labeling. That's gonna clean up your output considerably um, and make life easier. So again, in the general tab, change it to display names and in the output tab, should be names and then labels, names and then labels on the left there. Once you do that, hit OK. I'm going to hit cancel because I've already done this. You hit OK. And uh, it'll say, I'm going to, it'll say reset all dialogues, hit OK after that. And then we should be back to here. OK. So back, to, back at it, go to analyze, dimension reduction, factor. Once you do that, the window pops up. 
all the variables now should look like this on the left. Um, if, you, if you did that edit options thing. And then on the right, it's the variables we want to uh, include in our factor analysis. So I'm just going to click on anxiety one. I'm going to scroll down and hold shift and click on useful seven. So that selects everything from anxiety one to useful seven. It's all of our uh, measures for our reflective latent factors. I'm going to stick those in here just by hitting the arrow. And so they are all now ready to be analyzed. Don't hit OK yet. There are a few things we need to check over here on the right. In the descriptives option, uh, in descriptives menu, the default is to have the, uh, the initial solution and nothing here checked. Go ahead and check the KMO and the reproduced matrix, reproduce. There are a bunch of other things. I encourage you to go and explore those and have fun with those and learn what those give you. I won't be covering those in this video uh, or in this workshop, but there are lots of cool things you can do with factor analysis that uh, I don't do by default. So again, check the KMO and the reproduced, hit continue. And in the extraction menu, we have different methods for extracting factors. They're just different algorithms with different biases and constraints um, and parameters. And there are different schools of thought on this, which ones you should use, and if you should use them uh, intentionally, theoretically. And uh, in the end, I, I like what Joseph Hare has to say about this. Joseph Hare is this popular methodologist. He's probably the most cited methodologist in the management area or in the business school. Um, he wrote the multivariate data analysis book um, in all of its editions. Uh, but he says in his book, in the end, the results are almost identical. This is an exploratory factor analysis. Choose whatever you want and then try a different thing. And if it gives you better information, then you've done your job of exploring. So is there a reason to choose one over the other? Yeah, there is actually. Uh, but does it matter terribly? No, it doesn't. So pick one. Uh, I'm going to start with principal components. It's kind of the softest solution. Um, and is the most friendly usually for most data sets. So I'm going to pick principal components. And um, I should ask, can you guys actually see my screen? Is it too small? Is the text too small? It's too small, but I can still see. I don't know about others. Because I can go like this. Does that help? Yes. Yes. Well, I'll, I'll do that yes. on occasion to zoom in. That's better. I, I have a 4K screen and it's really, really big. Uh, so on laptops, it might not show up very well. All right, so that was in the extraction menu. We're going to do principal components for now. Um, and you can also extract factors based on various criteria. The, the common approach is to extract based on eigenvalues. Eigenvalues are just a measure of the contribution of a factor towards the explanation of variance in the resulting solution. Um, and so anything with an eigenvalue over one is considered a good contributor and so worthwhile of extracting. Uh, we'll start there and see how it goes. Hit continue. And then in the rotations menu, let me zoom out, sorry, it's gonna get a little dizzy for a sec. There we go. Um, a factor analysis, uh, quote unquote, rotates the data in order to maximize the distance between factors, um, to create more discriminance between factors. And so we do want to rotate. And the most popular is probably Vermax. The most useful, I would say, is Promax. Um, it's faster with big data sets, um, and it does maximize distance. If you can't get a good solution with Promax, you can try Vermax. Uh, there are different reasons to choose each of these. Go ahead and just choose, uh, for now, choose Promax. Trust me on this one, hit continue. We're not gonna go into the scores menu, although there are some useful things there. For those who are familiar with factor scores or latent variable scores, uh, you, can, uh, you can save those through that menu. And then in the options menu, let me zoom out again. Whoop. Here are the options. Um, we're going to, uh, there are no missing values in this data set, so I'm not going to mess with that for now. But you, if you had missing values, you could choose one of these options. Um, and then we could sort our result by size, which is useful, but I'm not going to do it right now. 
and we can suppress small coefficients, which I am going to do. What this does is in the resulting solution, which is a pattern matrix, which is essentially a matrix of the groupings of the items, um, we can suppress any coefficients that are not very meaningful to our analysis. I'm gonna suppress all the way up at 0.3 um, because I'm not really interested in loadings less than 0.3. Um, in fact, less than 0.4 is not very useful um, for what we're doing, but I'll set it at 0.3 for now so we don't uh, miss important information. Hit continue, and now we're ready. Um, we can hit OK. And I'll zoom out for a sec. Okay, yours might run for a sec. Yours might be done already. Um, here are the results. The KMO and Bartlett's says, uh, to what extent is this set of variables that we've included in the factor analysis usable or adequately correlated to run a factor analysis? Is it even appropriate to use this set of variables for factor analysis? And it's, it's assessed based on uh, more or less the covariance matrix, uh, the extent to which all variables are related to all variables or at least to enough variables. Um, and in this case, we want the KMO to be high, approaching one. Uh, anything over 0.8 is considered fine. Uh, over 0.9 is good. And we want the significance of the Bartlett's test to be uh, with a p-value less than 0.05. And in this case, we do have that. So what does that mean? That means the set of variables we've chosen do have su efficient, sufficiently high and sufficiently uh, a, a sufficient number of correlations within this set of variables. So they are appropriate for factor analysis. And then the communalities table in the extraction column, this is a similar test. It says, well, to what extent is each item related to other items in this set of variables? And we want high, approaching one is probably too high, but um, we want them above about 0.3. You'll read different thresholds out there. Some say 0.4, some say 0.2. Um, anything around 0.3 or above is considered adequately correlated. So as I look through this, uh, through this table, I don't see any that are particularly low. There's a 0.38, but everything else seems to be adequately correlated with other variables. What this means is that the solution we receive will likely have a loading, a primary loading for every measure. There won't be any measure that doesn't really load anywhere because all of the variables are related to something. So that's good. This total variance explained uh, table, it tells us something like an R squared uh, over here in this cum cumulative percent uh, column. It says what percent of the variance is explained by the solution we've derived. And the solution we've derived is a nine factor model or nine component model. So we see that in this uh, second column here, the total column, these are the eigenvalues. And we have nine factors or components that have eigenvalues greater than one. And so it has extracted a solution with nine factors because nine eigenvalues greater than one. What's good in terms of how many factors are extracted, good would be what we expect. Of course, if it's exploratory, we don't know what to expect um, theor theoretically. But in this case, we do know what to expect because we had names on these uh, measures and, and we came into it with an idea of where every measure should go. In terms of uh, the percent of variance explained, more is better usually. And anything over 60% is great. Anything over 50% is adequate. So um, that's the variance explained. You can see we had 47 measures included. And so it could have extracted 47 different factors if every measure uh, bucketed into its own factor, which would not be good. Um, then there's no real relationships between factors. I'm going to skip the components matrix for now and go down to the reproduced correlations matrix. This is a massive matrix, which shows the error, the residuals on uh, the solution. And we want to minimize error as always. And so a lower number here in this percentage is better. Um, different thresholds are published. Uh, some say 5%, some say 50%, uh, less is better. So 10%, that's probably okay. And here is the solution, the pattern matrix. This is what we really want to look at. 
and it shows us how our measures group together into factors or components in this case since we did a principal components analysis and where you see no loading where it's just blank that means the loading was less than our suppression threshold we, we set our suppression threshold to 0.3 so any loadings that aren't at 0.3 or above uh, they're just missing they're, they're not showing here but we can see here that the loadings which we hope will approach one um, for anxiety measures all load together and nothing else loads with them across that matrix so that's probably a good thing uh, that shows uh, good convergent validity that they all hang together and good discriminant validity that nothing else tries to uh, group with them same with computer use or no that's comprehensive use i should explain this data uh, this data is a data set of uh, how you use Excel. I mean, very, very uh, old school stuff. Uh, how, how do you use Excel? Do you use it comprehensively in unique ways, atypically, playfully, uh, which is silly, but very academic, um, but it works well for a data set. Anyway, so this factor comprised of these four measures also has good convergent and discriminant validity. For convergence, we want to see loadings above 0.5, uh, ideally averaging out above 0.7, um, but definitely above 0.5. Well, not definitely. There, there are very, very few definites in exploratory factor analysis, um, but higher is generally better. Above 0.9, you start get, getting suspicious um, that there's maybe some high multicollinearity multi going on. We look down, playfulness looks pretty good. Average loading is pretty high. Social desirability, we see breaks up into three factors. Oh, well, that's interesting. So social desirability is this measure, you guys are probably familiar with it, it's the measure of uh, to what extent do I answer things in a way that uh, is socially desirable? Um, do I say that I, I gossip a lot or am I influenced by the social desirable answer, socially desirable answer, and I say no, I never gossip at all. Um, so this broke up into three different factors, which is telling. So it is not a single construct we're measuring with these items. There are multiple constructs or dimensions of this construct going on. So we might want to take a look at that in a minute. This one, information acquisition loaded well, decision quality loaded pretty well, usefulness loaded very well. And so the only mess is over here in social desirability. Um, what we could do, for those who are familiar with social desirability, um, we just need it to assess method bias in the end uh, in our confirmatory factor analysis. Um, so we, it's not a theoretically um, a critical variable, it is a, a is a methodologically useful variable. And so uh, I'm not too concerned with how it played out like this. When we, when we model it in the CFA, we might break it up. In fact, you can see here, there's one item, social desirability three, that seems to load on two different factors. Is this a problem? The answer is uh, not in this case because the distance between these two loadings, the difference is pretty good. Um, it's more than 0.2, it's almost 0.3 different, which means it's not really uh, cross-loading between these factors. It has a primary loading right here on factor eight. Um, and then it just happens to be correlated with those two, uh, those two other items on factor nine. So we don't need to adjust this at all. Now this is a good solution. It just worked, which is terrible for a workshop because, and also good for a, a short workshop. It's good because uh, we don't have to go and troubleshoot, but it's terrible because in real life, this will never happen. Um, I mean, unless you are really good at uh, measurement design and study design and survey design, this will almost never happen that it works first time. Um, so let's pretend for a moment that we do not want social desirability to break out into three dimensions. What could we do? Well, we could try this again. So just back up here, um, analyze dimension reduction. 
factor. And in the extraction menu, instead of extracting based on eigenvalues, what if I just extracted based on what I expect? And what I expect is seven factors because we had nine and two of them were redundant, right? There were, there were three um, factors for social desirability, but we only wanted one. So let's take off two of them and see if social desirability sort of consolidates into a single factor. So again, that was in the extraction menu. I just changed the extraction options uh, instead of I, based on eigenvalues, we're gonna fix it at an exact number of factors. This is useful uh, for exploring your data. Continue and hit okay. Now we didn't add or remove any variables. And so these first few tables aren't going to change. Uh, they are identical, but the total variance explained table will change because instead of nine factors, we now have seven factors. We can look at the cumulative variance. It's still above 60, which is great. So we're good there. And we can go down to the reproduced matrix to see if there's more or less error. Looks like there is more error because we uh, imposed an unnatural constraint on this, on this solution. So there's more error, but is it a lot of error? Not really. It's, it's not up to 50%. So we're good. Here's that solution. And we can look at social desirability and what happened. Ooh, it clearly does not want to consolidate onto a single factor. Um, in fact, what it did was since we forced it to have seven factors, it said, well, the most tightly related factors are actually information acquisition and decision quality. So let's push them all onto a single factor and then let social desirability stay separate onto two factors. So this is not an ideal solution. We should probably just leave it how it was with nine factors. And then when we model it in our CFA, we'll model it as three different factors. Okay, I wanna show you one more thing in an EFA, take a few questions, and then we're pretty much gonna be done with SPSS and we'll move on to Amos. Um, so the other thing I wanna show you is in an EFA, um, I should show you here, actually, here's a shortcut in SPSS if you didn't know. Uh, there is this button right here next to the edit undo button. Um, it's the recall recently used dialogues. This is all the stuff you've done recently. Uh, you might not have a lot in here, but there is factor analysis up here. And you can just hit that instead of going back through the menu system and trying to find it. The last thing I wanted to show you is in the scores option. Let's see, oh, got to zoom out. There we go. Here it is. In the scores menu, um, there is an option to save as variables the factor scores. So let's say you didn't have Amos or some structural equation modeling software, and you just wanted to stay here in SPSS, do some multivariate regression or general linear modeling or something like that, um, something that SPSS could handle. Um, and in fact, SPS can handle a lot now, especially since um, Hayes, David, David Hayes, I think that's his name, um, made that macro called process. Uh, he made it so that SPSS can actually do mediation and moderation. And so if you wanted to stay in SPSS and not bother with latent factors, you can save these factors as scores. And what it will do is it will take every factor, I'm just gonna hit continue there. Um, it'll take every factor in the pattern matrix and create a standardized score of uh, as a new variable to represent the entire factor. So instead of eight items for one of the factors, you'll have one. And that one will be more or less a centroid of the factor um, representing all of the items that were on that factor. So it's a good representation of the factor. In fact, it's way better than an average or a sum or a proxy. Uh, a proxy is when you take one item from a measure as a proxy for all of the other items. Um, this factor score is a more accurate estimate of the measurement of that construct. So if you hit save, then what it does, I'm actually going to change our extraction real quick back to eigenvalues so we get a good solution here. Um, continue. 
what it'll do and when you hit OK is part of the process of analysis is it will produce over in your data set. Let me zoom out over here in your data set. If you were to go to the very end, you'll see there are now up here, let me zoom in again, new variables that we didn't have before called fact C1, fact 2, 1, um, and 3, 1. And these are the factor scores for the pattern matrix. And how do you know which one is which? Well, you go back over to your output, go to your pattern matrix, and you can see factor 1 here is, if you scroll down, it is these items, useful. So I would then go back to my data set, go to my variable view down here on the left, because there's a data view and a variable view. I would go to the variable view and find that new factor score, this one right here, fact 11. One. And I would change this to usefulness. That is the new one. And you could say it's the over here in the label, useful factor score something like that. And so now I have a single observed, well, calculated variable representing that entire factor. And now I can use that in a regression um, or in an ANOVA or, or whatever I want uh, here in SPSS. The reason you'd want to do that instead of retaining the latent factor is just if you were to stay in SPSS or move over, over to Excel or something like that. Um, if you're going to use a structural equation modeling software like Amos or Smart PLS or M Plus or Stata or all those, there, there are a bunch, EQS, um, keep it latent. Uh, the one thing, one of the things the factor score doesn't do very well is estimate measurement error. There is some of that in the calculation of the factor score, but it is it doesn't account for the current model um, because it was built during the factor analysis where there are no um, guided parameters. It's all, it's all exploratory um, where the, the solution is built by the computer. Um, and so once we change the model by adding regression lines and covariance lines um, or parameters, then the new error inherent to the new model is not captured as well in a factor score as it is in a latent uh, measurement model. So keep it latent if you can, you'll have a more accurate um, model. The other reason you might wanna use a factor score instead of a uh, latent factor is that it's vastly simpler. Uh, you will not have such a complex model. And so uh, when it comes to estimating a solution, it's easier to minimize error. You have fewer degrees of freedom um, and so it's easier to find a solution than if you have a complex latent model. Uh, so if you have a low sample size, for example, and you don't want to estimate um, a massive covariance matrix because you have so many variables in a latent uh, factor model, then, then you can use factor scores, which will really reduce that covariance matrix and make it much easier to run. So that'd be another reason. The last reason I can think of uh, is related, it, again, due to complexity, if you're going to run a moderation, um, like an interaction between two variables, it is very complicated to do that in a latent form. Um, it's way easier to take a two-step approach and, and do a multiplication of two factor scores rather than a pairwise uh, permutation of multiplications of all of the items associated with each of those factors. Uh, that gets really complicated. Okay, that's the end of factor analysis. Maybe, I think, yes. I'm, I'm actually gonna say a couple more things on factor analysis real quick. Um, and, then, and then we'll move on. Um, the, the things you want to test in a factor analysis, the, the quality criteria are threefold or fourfold. Um, in the outcome, it's really just threefold. Uh, you wanna assess Convergent and discriminant validity. So are the, are the factor loadings tight and, and, uh, or high, I guess, um, above 0.5, ideally above 0.7? In this case, we can see yes, in almost every case, we have loadings above 0.7. Um, 
Are they distinct, discriminant? Uh, are they cross-loading? And the answer is yes, in this case, we're good. Um, there are no major secondary loadings on any of these factors. The closest we came was here with social desirability three. And even this cross-loading isn't a problem because it's pretty different. Uh, the primary loading is much higher than the secondary loading. So we have discriminant validity, uh, which means that we, we have distinct factors that are measuring distinct constructs or distinct dimensions of a construct in the case of social desirability. Um, so that's convergent and discriminant validity. We also want to assess face validity, which is do the groupings make sense? Um, or do we have like some jumble of items on a single factor? Uh, if we have some jumble of items on a single factor, what we'd want to do is go look at the wording of the measures, assuming they were survey questions, go look at what it's actually measuring and see if there's some common theme that we didn't pick up on um, that's causing a bunch of uh, what we expected to be unrelated measures to be measuring the same thing, the same factor. And if there truly is a common theme, then maybe we form a new factor that we weren't expecting. If it seems to be random or, or just coincidence, then there is no face validity to that factor. Uh, it doesn't make sense. It's a statistical anomaly, which does happen. Um, and in that case, tough decisions need to be made about whether or not to, to remove items or to separate the factors based by, by omitting certain uh, measures. The last is reliability. You want to assess the Cronbach's alpha um, to see if these are reliable factors. The way to do that in SPSS, I, I wish it would just do it automatically in the EFA, that would make sense. But the way to do it in SPSS is to go to analyze at the top, go to scale and reliability analysis. And when you click on that, it brings up this little menu where you can take a factor's measures. So for example, anxiety one through seven, stick it over here in items and hit okay. And that will produce a reliability score, a Cronbach alpha, let's see, oops, wrong way, there we go. Um, which if I can zoom into it here, uh oh, sorry, this is jumpy, trying to get, there it is. Um, the Cronbach alpha in this case is 0.934. We want a Cronbach alpha ideally above 0.7, although there are some justifications for slightly lower if you have only a few items. As you know, uh, fewer items means higher error, and so uh, higher error means lower Cronbach alpha by by uh, by its nature. Um, a few uh, smaller set of items means uh, potentially uh, a bias towards lower um, Cronbach alphas. So ideally above 0.7, but if you only have like three items in a measure, in a factor, um, then you could accept down to 0.6. Uh, there is some justification there. Okay. Andrew Hayes. Ah, oh, thank you, Alice. Not Dave. Not David. Uh, thank you for that correction. Okay. Um, I think I think that's all I want to say about EFA. Are there any questions about the EFA? That was a lot, like, yeah. Um, I do have one question. Uh, first yeah. of all, thank you very much for all of the information that you shared. Um, yeah. I just have a quick question about, do you advise that we do EFA on all of the constructs at the same time or one at a time? Oh, this is such a great question because um, there are some uh, university doctoral programs that teach a very wicked tradition uh, to do an EFA on a single construct at a time. What's the point of that? Uh, the whole point of the EFA is to explore the multiple dimensionality of, of your data set and uh, to explore the discriminants between factors. If you only do one construct's measures at a time, you can't test discriminant validity. So you like that way. It's like if you go to Disneyland and you don't ride on Thunder Mountain. Like, what was the point of that? Um, so, so yeah, you should always be testing as, ma as many variables as you have data for uh, that are appropriate for a factor analysis. So, for example, um, in this data set, we have a bunch of variables. 
let's say I collected this data with the intention of doing multiple studies. And so there are actually more measures in here than I'm going to include in my first uh, model. Would I still include all of the measures in a factor analysis or just the measures for that model? And the answer is I would include all of them. Here's why. It's more and better information and it's more opportunity for uh, measures to find a dimensional home. Uh, and, and so it, it, it's, like, it's like if you had a large data set, would you want to include your full data set or just part of the data set uh, in terms of sample size? Um, include the full data set because it minimizes error. Same idea here. The more, more variables you have, assuming you have enough uh, sample size, uh, the, potential to, uh, the greater the potential to minimize error and have a more accurate representation of reality. So yeah, include all the variables that are appropriate. Notice I didn't include uh, age, experience, gender, industry, things like that. Um, they are not appropriate for a factor analysis because they do not belong to reflective latent constructs. Um, there, are, there are occasions to include them. I, I won't cover them here, but in, in your standard SEM analysis, you would only include reflective latent measures and all of them. Thanks for the question. Any other questions about EFA? Um, for those who, oh, go ahead. Oh, 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 I have a question. We were, um, yesterday there was a session um, by Lisa and I forgot her last name, but she said, if you have a scale that you're testing, no reason to do an EFA. So right. do you- Yeah, let me oh. cover that again. I, I'm glad you brought it up. So there are different, uh, schools of thought, different camps on um, on whether you should do an exploratory factor analysis or if you should just jump into confirmatory. Um, if you boil it down to what is required, uh, definitely if you have a, a scale that you have built with a uh, theoretical construct in mind, uh, you do not need to do EFA. You can jump straight to CFA. There is no compelling requirement to do an EFA on data that has a measurement theory going into it a priori. So, and that applies to 99% of all cases, which is I build a survey based on a model that I have a priori, which has constructs that I'm intentionally measuring. Um, very rarely would you have a data set where there was no a priori model going into that data set. Although there are cases where that does occur which is in secondary data, um, data run by a different organization, by uh, like the World Health Organization or World Bank or the government. Um, very rarely do they have an a priori theory. They just have a bunch of questions they wanna ask. And in that case, yeah, you, sh you should do an EFA. Um, but, uh, and, and it would be required because you don't know the constructs a priori. Now, so then, if this only occurs in 1%, of, of all SEM uh, analyses, why teach it? Uh, the main reason is I still do it for every data set because EFA is way better at um, surfacing discriminant validity concerns than a CFA. In the CFA, it's very guided. It, 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 you'd say these measures belong to this construct uh, or to this factor, I guess. and so you're constraining the model from the get-go. Um, in an EFA, you don't have that. You just say, here are the variables, you go find the, 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 the factors, and it has no theory, the, the software has no theory about how these should factor. And so it's really good at, at surfacing the dimensionality of, of the constructs. Case in point, let me go back to the output here. Um, when we go look at the pattern matrix and we look at social desirability, if I had jumped straight to CFA, what would I have done? I would have made one factor for social desirability. But when we tried to do that, let me zoom out, go back to this one. When we tried to do that, this is what happened. It says, no, I am not one construct. I refuse to be one construct. Even if you constrain me to be one construct, I refuse. 
and it, it will not converge onto a single, uh, single factor. And the EFA revealed that. Whereas if I jumped straight into the CFA, I would have just struggled to figure out what is going on with this construct? Why won't it converge? How are there multiple dimensions? If there are, how do I see them? Because in a confirmatory factor analysis, you don't get a pattern matrix. There is actually some software that produces a loadings matrix, um, but in, for the most part, you don't get a pattern matrix. And so you don't get to see where the natural unguided loadings are. And that's why I do an EFA. More information is more better, right? Yeah. And it's easy. This, this took like half an hour, 45 minutes, which is really long. Um, and uh, in, in practice, when you're not explaining it to someone and having people follow along, it takes 10 minutes. Uh, so just do it. Thank you. For, it. Thank you for explaining. That, that's welcome. helpful. Oh, good. I'm writing a paper right now that explains why you want to do an EFA, even in an a priori theorized uh, model. And oh, it's been rejected from journal after journal after journal. And <laughs> so Actually, I will get it published. If you want to send it uh, to me, I'm, I'm doing scale development. I'll cite it if it helps. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I have a good plan for it. It'll, it'll get published. Yeah. Any other questions on EFA? I know we've spent like half our time here. I apologize. Okay. Now that we've now that you've seen the pace at which we're going and you've gotten familiar with the software somewhat, are there any who are still following along um, with me in 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 uh, in the software? Uh, in other words, do you want me to keep going at this pace, or should I speed it up because not many people are following along? I think we can speed it up. <laughs> speed it up. All right. I, in Amos, I'm, I'm going to assume you're not following along. I'm just going to show you and explain. Uh, and the point there is to expose you to Amos and see what it's capable of uh, so that you might, in the future, decide to use it. I get nothing from it. Uh, I get no kickbacks. In fact, I emailed IBM and said, hey, I'm making a bunch of plugins and, and automation tools for Amos. Can, can, I, can we collaborate? And they said no. Uh, so I get nothing from this. Uh, but I find it useful, and and I don't like syntax-based uh, statistics software. And I, I'm a developer. I'm a programmer, uh, and I don't like syntax-based software. So for those who are not developers, I can imagine it's so much worse. Um, so I'm just going to show you some stuff. I'm going to open up Amos, get it up on this screen. Takes a moment to load because it's IBM. Thinking it's like Adobe, like opening up that software. Man, it takes forever. Here we go. Let me pull this over. Oops. Oh, this is someone else's model that I was playing with. I help out people every day around the world and they send me their models and data. And that was one of them. All right. <clears throat> Let's see, I'm gonna load a data set real quick. Um, just a sec, I need to move this. Oh, there we go. Okay, so in Amos, this is Amos. It was built in like the 90s and they never updated the interface. Uh, it is very 1994-ish. Um, I'm gonna link a data set by using file system. Uh, I'm just gonna use this data set we've been using, the EAM 2021. And again, I'm not gonna go as slow as I have been going. Um, Hit OK, and the, the slow way to do this is to use this little candelabra, and um, you can draw latent factors here, um, and then click on them, and it creates items for those factors. So the, the observed measures would go in the rectangles, the latent factor name would go in the ellipse here, and then the, the small circles here are the residuals, the error. Um, it's kind of a pain to do this manually, so I wrote a plugin that would just do it all for us. So let me just erase this. Um, the, the plugin says, let's see, it's the pattern matrix builder. And pull this up here. Uh, it just says paste your pattern matrix in here. So I'm going to go copy my pattern matrix. 
copy and paste and hit create diagram. And it should, hopefully, there we go, it creates the diagram for us, uh, which is way faster and way less error prone than uh, using the manual approach. Let me just really quickly name each of these um, so that we have useful names. This is useful. Uh, ooh, I have I have a variable named useful in the data set. So I'm going to call this useful f as for factor. You can't have latent factor names um, that are identical to your observed variable names in your data set. Uh, we have a variable named useful. We don't have one called usefulness because I didn't save the data set. So I'll just use that. Anyway, decision quality, DEC quality. So I've got to be careful about what I name these things. Um, anxiety. I'm going to put an F on there because I think we have one named anxiety already. Playfulness, because I don't think it's called that. Um, info acquisition. Pretend I spelled that right. Comp use. Uh, you don't want um, comprehensive, rehensive. There we go. Uh, you don't want spaces or mathematical symbols in your variable names, uh, in your latent factor names. Social desirability A. Social desirability B. Hopefully, these aren't uh, bad acronyms in some language. All right, there you go. So here we have our measurement model or CFA. And this is a lot like our factor analysis we just did in SPSS, except we have told the software exactly where every variable goes, exactly what group it belongs to, whereas SPSS tries to figure that out iteratively. Um, so we are constraining the model to, to already have a solution. And so what you want to do, since we're already telling it what the solution is, is you want to compare your proposed model, this is our proposed model, to the observed model. The observed model is the covariance matrix that is inherent in the data set. So every variable is related to every other variable in the data set by its nature. There is a, an R coefficient, a correlation coefficient associated with every pair of variables. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> excuse me, um, if we were to take that covariance matrix, and more or less subtract the covariance matrix implied by this CFA, this solution, we would get the chi-square statistic. And so the bigger the difference between the observed covariance matrix and the proposed covariance matrix, the bigger the chi-square. The bigger the chi-square, the worse the model fit. And in this case, model fit literally means how well does your model fit the observed covariance matrix. Um, and so again, the bigger the chi-square, the worse fit, because the bigger the chi-square, the big, bigger the difference between the observed covariance matrix and the one you're proposing. And so if we were to like move variables around and assign them to uh, groups that they don't belong to, there would be a, a more error associated with that proposed model. And the more error, the higher the chi-square, the higher the difference. So worse the fit. So we can test the fit. We just uh, Actually, got to do a couple things first. We're going to go to the analysis properties, which is up here on the top left. Um, it is the abacus with a color palette. Terrible, terrible interface. Um, oops, excuse me. We're going to click on that, and it brings up this window called analysis properties, which just disappeared. Where'd it go? Here it is. Uh, down here, it was on a different screen. So it brings up the analysis properties and you can set a bunch of different uh, properties here. We're just gonna go straight to the output tab and we want standardized estimates because it's easier to read and, uh, and relate. And then we want modification indices at a certain threshold. A modification index is a, uh, is a, is a measure of how the chi-square statistic would change if you were to add a parameter to the model that is not currently there. It's essentially saying, hey, this covariance matrix from the observed model is really different from the proposed one. But if you were to add this one from the observed model to the proposed one, the chi-square would drop by a certain amount. So 
What is the threshold we want to see for that? Uh, this is a relative threshold because the chi-square is a relative measure. So the more complex your model, the more uh, sample size you have, the higher you want your threshold. In this case, I'm going to set it at 20. Um, how do I know that? Experience. Uh, you'll figure it out as you do more of these. There is no OK button, so you just hit X. And zoom out. And then let's save it with the floppy disk. And I'm just going to save it here, EAM 2021. And I'm going to run it with the regular old abacus, not the one with the color palette on it. Looks like a piano a little bit. It runs. It says there is an error. I have no valid license. I'm really glad this happened. Um, I do have a valid license. This error occurs randomly, it, it, it seems. Uh, every now and then. So hit OK, and OK, and OK, and OK. And I'm going to save this. If you didn't get that error, fabulous. Um, and if you're following along, uh, I'm going to just close Amos. And then I'm going to reopen Amos. I'm really glad the closed captioning understands the word Amos. That could turn out bad. Um, here we go. Here's the same model. I'm just going to run it again. Oh, look, it works this time. Um, found my license. Again, weird error. I don't know why they do that. OK, here's the solution. But th this is the unstandardized solution. I'm going to switch over here to the left where it says standardized. Um, I'm just going to click standardized. And that will automatically toggle over to standardized estimates. And you can see the advantage here. Uh, for those of you who use R, or uh, Stata, or M plus, or any non-visual SEM software, you can see some advantage here. There's a visual representation of the model, which is so helpful to, to understand your model. And the output comes out on the model, which is so useful, instead of trying to sift through tables of output. Um, and it's just organized and pretty. It's, it, I like it much prefer this. What we see here is the estimates, the loadings of the items on the factor. And just like in the EFA, in the CFA, we want loadings above 0.5, ideally above 0.7, averaging out above 0.7 at the very least. And we observe that's roughly what we have here. Here's a 0.53, but everything else looks pretty good. So that factor is fine. And so we can scroll down and just make sure we've got uh, more or less good results here. And it looks like we do until we get down to social desirability, which we have obviously here not averaging out to 0.7. Same here, same here. So what do we do in this case? Um, this is evidence that we don't have convergent or discriminant. Oh, sorry, not convergent. Um, we don't have convergent validity here. Those loadings are too low. Um, and so what do we do about that? Well, in the case of social desirability, like I said before, it is a method con uh, factor. It is a methodologically useful factor, but it's not a theoretically useful factor. It's not a core component of our theory. And so I'm not terribly concerned about its validity. Um, I'm using it to eventually, in, in a method bias test, extract shared variance, uh, that variance that is shared with this idea of, of, of social desirability. Um, and so that is the only way I'm going to use this. So I'm not concerned. I'm really just concerned with my theoretically important factors here. And they all look good. Now, how, how good are they? Well, we need to check the model fit, which we were talking about, which is in this output um, option, which will come up in just a second. Let's see, here it is here. Um, this is the output. So there is some table output. It's not all visual. And um, let me zoom in. You can see your basic output, your chi-square and your degrees of freedom, um, which are relative to the complexity of the model and the sample size. So we have a pretty high chi-square here. And our p-value for the model fit is uh, significant, which 
counterintuitively, we don't want, because uh, this is a test of bad fit. Um, we want the probability that chi square is zero to be non-significant. Uh, we, we don't want, or we want the chi square to be zero. We don't want it to be different from zero. Um, and so, anyway, you want this p-value above 0.05. Uh, if you go to the model fit here, we can see some familiar measures like, let me scroll down here, the CFI, the comparative fit index. Uh, we want the CFI for the default model, that's the, the estimated model, to be above 0.9, ideally above 0.95 um, for model fit. And there are other measures you probably recognize here, the NFI, the TLI, uh, the RMSEA is a popular one. Um, we want that less than 0.06, ideally, and the P-close to be non-significant again. And um, I think those are all the ones I want to show you here. There is, uh, for some of you, you you're all going to have your favorite model fit measures if you do SEM. Um, and different journals have different preferred fit measures. There is one called the SRMR that is pretty standard. That's in the plugins menu by default with Amos. And for the SRMR, if you run that plugin, this happens, which is not intuitive. Nothing happens. Um, but if you run this model with that window open, it will disappear and then reappear with the SRMR value, which here is very small, uh, 0 0.048. You want it less than 0 0.08. So we're pretty good. This is a good fitting model. And again, what does that mean? That means that I'm not applying unnatural constraints to the measures. The, the sets of measures that we are proposing here, that the useful one through seven uh, measures belong together, that is not unnatural. It is a natural grouping that we would probably find if we did an exploratory factor analysis. So that's that. Um, if you end up doing that, uh, if you end up watching my videos or doing my course, um, there are a bunch of plugins here that will produce output for you um, automatically. Here's a model fit plugin that I'm running. And you'll see it produces a model fit table um, that can be copied and pasted and interprets for you and gives you thresholds and uh, references. Um, so it just does it all for you. Um, and those of you who are used to using R, or M plus, you'll realize how useful this is. Um, you don't have to sift through and make your own tables. There's another really useful one. Um, let's see, validity with confidence intervals. Let's see if this works. It's thinking. Here we go, it's gonna make it. Please, please work. Still thinking. <laughs> it's calculating a lot of stuff. This is a very complex model. Um, and it's producing an HTMT uh, ratios matrix. Um, uh, here it is. Holy cow. Um, it produced a correlation matrix, square root of the ABE on the diagonal, um, found significant correlations, produced the composite reliability. Let me zoom in. The CR, composite reliability, the ABE, the MSV. Um, and, and a bunch of other statistics which help you understand the convergent validity and discriminant validity and reliability, which I'll go through real quick. For re reliability in James, a CFA. Can I ask you one question? Sorry. Of course, yeah. Um, so um, I have looked at your plugins and they're free, I know, but how can I put it into my AMOS? Because my, mine is university provided, so I think it restricts my ability. Ooh, is, to... it, is it on Citrix, like a virtual? Yeah, it is on cloud, yeah. I don't know how to do it in, in the cloud. Okay, um, I just thought, I just don't know how to do it. I just don't know what it is. Okay, thank you. Uh, my guess would be, it would have to be in the local, uh, the virtual local machine. And so you'd have to find the hidden folder of app data in okay. the local virtual machine. Um, and it would, you'd have to have permission to view that hidden folder, which I doubt. I kind of doubt your institution would allow that. No, I don't it's think unfortunate. so. unfortunate. Which is so sad because I could have avoided it's so much sad. work. <laughs> it's phenomenal what you do and provide to others. Uh, if only it worked everywhere. Um, so here's the composite reliability. You want the CR column. You want those values to be greater than 0.7. 
um, when they're not here in the SDA, uh, the social desirability uh, factors, those are not where we want them. But again, it's a methodological variable, not theoretically uh, useful. Um, so I'm not so concerned. What I am concerned with is if there is a red in the theoretically useful variables here, and I see in information acquisition, ABE is flagged. And I'm trying to figure out why. Oh, it's because the maximum shared squared variance is greater than the ABE, which is a sign of discriminant validity issues. Um, but there are many different measures of discriminant validity. This is only one of them. So you'd want multiple signs to say, oh, this has a problem. One of the most common is the Fornell-Larker approach, which is uh, does the square root of the ABE, in this case for information acquisition, that's 0.726, is that greater than any correlation with all other variables? Um, and so I look to the left with these correlations and uh-oh, yep, there is a 727, which is greater than the 726. So there is a discriminant validity issue. One more measure of this though is the HTMT, which is found down here. And I can look at the HTMT for information acquisition and the one it's crossing with, which is um, decision quality right here. So 765. You want the threshold for that ratio to be less than 0 0.850. And so actually we do have one measure of discriminant validity that says there is no problem. This is the most recent measure. And so I would feel comfortable relying on it um, to say, no, we don't have a discriminant validity issue here, even though the Fornell-Larker failed and this other test of maximum shared square variance versus ABE failed. Uh, HTMT passed. And so we're good enough. Anyway, useful stuff, confidence intervals for all that, um, and citations. Anyway, so that's that's the CFA. There, there's so much more in the CFA, uh, so much more that I haven't covered. There's method bias, there's invariance testing, which is a pain in the rear, um, and, I, and I hate doing it. Um, Anyway, there's a bunch of stuff you can do in a CFA, but we don't have time for. Uh, you can find it in my videos, you can find it in my course, and, and I've written plugins for most of it to make it less painful. Oh, where to get the course uh, or, or the videos? There we go, somebody pasted it, thanks. Um, the videos are there. I have, let me paste the course in as well. Let's see, I have it up here somewhere. Here it is, copy that link, and I'll paste it in here. That's the, oh, that went to Alice only. Sorry, let's see. Paste again. There we go, that went to everybody. Okay, um, so that's the course. Let me go back to Amos. Any questions about CFA before we do some causal modeling in, in Amos? Okay, if you do have a question, just, just chat it or, or interrupt. Um, again, I only scratch the surface of CFA. There is, there are so many layers to CFA. Um, and the whole purpose of the CFA is to validate your measures uh, in two factors, to have confidence that when you go into causal modeling, saying that this variable predicts that variable, uh, that you have confidence that those variables are distinct. They are different, uh, they are different constructs, uh, measures of different constructs, and that those measures are reliable. Uh, that's the whole point of a factor analysis is to validate your factors so that when you move on to testing your theory, that you have confidence that the variables used to test your theory are valid. Um, otherwise, you don't know whether what you find is just a statistical anomaly or random noise uh, or, or valid. So you got to do a measurement uh, validation here. So from here, uh, if we want to test some theory, there are multiple ways to do this. You can use factor scores like we produced in the EFA. You can also produce factor scores here. I, I can show you that. If you go to Analyze and Data Imputation, um, again, that was Analyze Data Imputation, we can produce factor scores based on this result. Um, and it'll, what, what it does is it produces these factor scores into a different data set. 
which is just whatever your current data set is called in the same folder, but it adds an underscore C for composites. Um, I think it's for composites. I'm actually not positive what the C stands for, but that would be my guess. Um, so you just hit impute. It happens, hit close. And if it doesn't happen, there's, there's a good reason, um, which I cover in some of my troubleshooting uh, guides. And that data set, let me go find it here. Oh, you guys can't see that. It's in the same folder as the data set um, you're currently using. So I'm going to show you, here's my downloads folder, which not always safe to show your downloads folder on a recording Zoom call. I'm safe, don't worry. Um, okay, here is that data set, uh, underscore C. So if I were to open this, it would have factor scores in there uh, based on this Amos model. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do this both ways. I'm gonna show you a latent causal model and then I'm gonna show you a uh, a path model, an imputed causal model. To turn this CFA into an imputed causal model, ooh, actually, I want to show you one other thing first. I'm sorry, uh, not enough time. Uh, I want to show you a second order factor. Uh, we have here with social desirability three dimensions of the same factor. Let's pretend this was a theoretically interesting uh, factor. What I would do to turn this into a second order factor is I would omit all these correlations between them. Oh, I think I, yep. Trying to get rid of all of these little correlations. And some of you who use syntax-based software are thinking, ha, that's so slow. I can do that with like one line in R or an M plus. Yeah, but you can't see the model as easily. All right. Um, and now what we want to do is create a new latent factor over here, and I will call this social desirability. Where to go? Here it is. Uh, I will call this variable name social D for now, and close that. And I will connect it to its subdimensions. And since this is a covariance-based um, software, whoops, whoops, then we need to have a parameter constraint. Those who are familiar with SEM know that for all covariance-based methods, you need a parameter constraint per latent factor at the highest level. Um, so you'll notice on each of these latent factors, there is one, one per factor. And that is to provide a parameter constraint. It is a necessary condition of covariance-based methods. So I will add a parameter constraint here just to this top one. Double click the arrow, go to the parameters, add one, and close that. Also, you'll know that every predicted variable must have a residual associated with it. Notice all of these predicted boxes here have residuals, error. So I need to add error to these predicted dimensions. Now that's a mess. There we go, okay. Um, and I need to name them. There is a shortcut for that. You can just use a plugin, name parameters, not parameters, whoops, close that. Name unobserved variables. Here we go, name unobserved variables. It automatically names those for me. And now I can covary this with everything else and only draws clockwise how convenient so there it is covary this to everything else that's another thing all exogenous variables in covariance based methods must be covaried to all other exogenous variables you can actually run it without but it's an assumption of covariance based methods okay we now have a second order latent factor, reflective latent factor, that should run just fine if I were to hit run here. Big model. Okay, there we go. It does run just fine. Um, and now we can see it has loadings for each of these sub dimensions. 
Um, some of them are negative, which implies that they're inverse to each other, um, but it does work. We can see that this does work as a second order factor. Now, if we were to take this and move it to a causal model, a structural equation model with causal uh, parameters, we could do that by removing some covariances from our proposed endogenous variables, the, the dependent variables. So let's pretend for a moment that uh, decision quality is our dependent variable. What I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the arrows that go into decision quality, all the covariances. I'm going to, just for fun and for aesthetics, turn that around and move it with this fire truck. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, over here, and then I'm going to draw regression arrows from um, other factors to decision quality. And this is pretty basic because uh, I'm just having one dependent variable and a bunch of independent variables. Uh, in, in Amos, you can actually do mediators and moderators and stuff like that. Um, and I'm going to show that in a moment. But this is how you would draw a latent causal model. Um, and this should run just fine if I were to go run this. I'm getting an error. Oh, it says, I produce an error. It says, you don't have an error variable here. Yep, I need an error variable because it's being predicted. There we go. And I just need to name that. Parameters, text, variable name, E, what are we on? 51. Okay. And now I can run it. Should have used a smaller data set and smaller model. It would run a lot faster. At least I'm not bootstrapping. Okay. Here we go. It now produces, let me zoom in, regression estimates for these relationships. Um, you can see here, for example, information acquisition to decision quality has a standardized regression weight of 0.63. Um, I don't have this R squared displaying. Let me produce that in the analysis properties. In the output, there is a squared multiple correlations um, that I can produce. And actually, I can make this run a lot faster if I get rid of some of these checkboxes. There we go. Now run it. It's in that window as well that you would run your bootstrap if you wanted to bootstrap for uh, mediation or interaction or something. So it is producing now an R square of 0.58, which is pretty good. That's the variance explained in that dependent variable. Um, and that is a latent causal model. As you can see, this is very complex. Um, the model fit won't have changed much from what we observed in the CFA. If we were to reduce this down to factor scores and just create a path model, the model fit will change drastically because um, we have reduced the number of parameters drastically. And the covariance matrix has shrunk drastically from all of these observed items down to just a few. So let me show you that. I'm just going to save that and create a new, there we go, plugins. I'm just going to erase all of this. There we go. And connect new data set for the factor scores one. I'm going kind of fast here because we're going to run out of time. I'm just going to change the data set to this new one we created, underscore C. It's the one with the factor scores. Hit OK. And what you can see in this little stacky button thing is, oh, let me move it so you can see it. It's down here. Here we go. Uh, this is a window with all of our variables in it, including the factor scores we just created. Um, they're down here at the bottom. I can just drag these out into my model. Oops, I just did the same one. Let me zoom out. It'll be easier. OK. Um, there we go. OK, let me just pull out a few of these. And you can see what we can do here. I wish you could pull them all out simultaneously. That'd be nice, but you can't. Okay, close that. 
let me arrange these how I think theoretically they might relate to each other. I think uh, we're going to have comprehensiveness on the left, decision quality on the right, usefulness on in the middle, playfulness uh, in the back, information acquisition in the middle, this one on the left. Okay, here's what I think. I think these guys predict decision quality through the mediators of information acquisition and decision quality uh, and usefulness, excuse me. Um, and so I will co-vary these guys in the back. They're my exogenous variables. And I will predict these guys. Now I'm adding arrows everywhere for the sake of time, but uh, you wouldn't include ones that are not theoretically valid. And then I would provide error for anything predicted and I would name those errors. Okay, this is kind of an ugly um, model, but uh, magic clean this, there we go. Okay, but this is a causal path model uh, where we have implied uh, mediation through these two variables. And we can test all sorts of things in here. If we just run this, then we can see the R squares for each of the predicted variables on the top right, 0 0.25, 0 0.16, 0 0.61, the standardized regression coefficients, the standardized regression weights on the paths. Um, this is a very high coefficient. Um, and I can move things around a bit so we can see a little bit better. Oops. Move this to where we can see it. Move this to where we can see it. There we go. Okay. And so you can get a pretty quick uh, understanding of your causal model just at a glance, which is really nice. Um, you can also produce um, tables that, that will be useful, such as this, where you have each predictor, each outcome, and its standardized regression weight, and whether it's significant. Um, and and you, can, you can assess mediation. Um, I haven't, I have, a plugin for that. This is an estimand. Um, there is not enough time to explain estimands. <laughs> but let's see. Star dot estimand. Uh, star dot VB. Ooh. I'm going to have to show you that in a video later. I, I don't have estimand downloaded right now. So you can assess mediation through using an estimand. Essentially, it names parameters, multiplies parameters by each other to create indirect effects. Um, and those estimands are available uh, on the stat wiki for free. We have run out of time, unfortunately. I have another meeting I have to run to in two minutes. Um, let me show you one more resource. Uh, let me go to the stat wiki real quick so you can see where you would find this stuff. Um, StatWiki, wiki.gascanation.com. So here's a wiki. It covers uh, SEM topics uh, and includes uh, Amos and SPSS, but also uh, M plus and Smart PLS and even PLS Graph, which is like decades old, um, and has all the plugins in here, and it has uh, very useful references over here in the references area. So for different topics like validity and mediation, moderation, um, it has access to all the automation stuff. It's all free. I just make this stuff as a service for people. Um, and, and that's how I serve the community. Um, and if you get really stuck, there are tutors you can go to here, are a bunch of tutors who I've worked with, um, who know different software and different uh, methodologies. And here are their LinkedIn contacts. Anyway, there's so much more. Uh, I usually run a three-day boot camp to go through this that covers three semesters worth of statistics. I've tried to cram it down into an hour and a half, and it's just impossible. Um, but it's all we have time for. Any final questions for the last 60 seconds? Do we have all any right. questions? I can, oh, sorry, somebody was. No, 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 go ahead. Oh, somebody asks, can moderation be done with something like this also? 
Yes, um, you can run multi-group moderations, you can run interaction moderations, and I have videos for that, and you can find it here on the wiki too. If you go to uh, causal models, then uh, you'll see there are uh, how to run multi-group, how to run interactions, mediation, all that stuff. Let's see. Thank you. Oh, yeah, you're welcome. Um, any other questions? All right. Well, good luck. You can also email me. I I respond to every email I receive within 24 hours. Um, every day, I respond to a couple dozen statistics questions from around the world. Um, if you do email me, do me a favor. Since I do answer a lot of emails, uh, keep it brief. And if you, if it includes a model, just send me the model. Don't don't try to describe it in words. Um, I'm a very visual person. So thanks. Um, I will post this video to uh, YouTube. I hope you don't mind. None of your faces are on it. Um, I've kept it only on my screen. Uh, so your faces won't appear on the video. I gotta run. Okay. Thank you so much. James. Thank you, Thank yeah. You much awesome. Thank it. you. All right, let me stop recording. Uh, stop. There it is, stop recording.